Welcome to a new series I'm trying, an ESPN 2K5 rebuild using the Miami Dolphins. They're my favorite team, so why not start my first rebuild with them? They do have a lot of great players. Patrick Sertan, highest overall player on the team. He's a ball hawk in a shutdown corner. Unfortunately, he's on the final year of his contract, and I'm pretty sure he's going to be expensive. We don't have a lot of cap space. Jason Taylor is a Hall of Famer, really scary pass rusher. He's also locked up for six years with this team. Zach Thomas should be in the Hall of Fame, the brother-in-law of Jason Taylor. This man is one of the smartest defenders I've ever got the honor of watching. He's also locked up long term, five years. David Boston is highly rated in ESPN 2K5. He shouldn't be, but I'm not going to complain. His career in reality fell off a cliff this season. He got too swole. He's on a six-year deal with this team. Finally, Ricky Williams, he retired this season. I don't blame Ricky for retiring the, the previous two seasons. He still has three years left with this team. Let's take a look back at the rest of the roster. These two quarterbacks are freaking expensive for their rating. They're not worth it. Other than Ricky Williams, the running backs are pretty weak, but at least they're not expensive. Rob Conrad, if you don't already know who this man is, he swam back to land after many hours. Chris Chambers is one of my favorite Miami receivers. He is on a contract year. Since he's in his prime, I may try to re-sign him. Interesting thing about tight ends in 2K5 is they only use one during simulations. Lee and Perry will never see the field as receivers. Now we start to get to the weakness of this team. The offensive line, McKinney, will have to lead the charge at center. He's on a one-year deal, so this offseason may get interesting. The guards aren't any better sitting at a cool 74. Both Kerry and James will be starting. I think James has a great team-friendly contract. And now quarterbacks on this team hate him. The tackles. McIntosh is robbing this team with his contract. Like I said, the offseason will be interesting. Moving over to the defensive side of the roster, Bowens will be a starter this season along with Chester. Zagania's penalty being so low, I thought about trading him. The Ravens could use some help at defensive tackle. The Dolphins could use some help at offensive tackle. They have Orlando Brown, for those who don't know, his career was almost ended after a referee threw a flag at his eye. We need help at tackle. Even if he's only here as a gap player, I'd rather have quarterbacks not be afraid to play in Miami. Jeff Zagania is a good aging player. He can serve the Ravens the same way Brown can help the Dolphins. The Ravens agreed to a straight player for player trade. Our offensive line looks a little bit better than it did before. Hopefully this helps our offense. At defensive end, of course, we have Jason Taylor, but Ngulae is on a contract year, just like Chris Chambers. He's in the prime of his career. I want to continue to keep him if I can. Junior Seau was a member of the Miami Dolphins for a few seasons. It's amazing to me that this man played 20 seasons at linebacker of all positions. The depth behind him, not very good. <laughs> behind Zach Thomas, Derek Pope. Let's hope he doesn't get injured. Sam Madison is the other corner I grew up watching. He's earning more than Sertan, which makes me think that Sertan is going to be really expensive this offseason. At strong safety, Sammy Knight on a one-year contract. Edwards could develop this season. That would help us out a lot since he's really cheap. Arturo Freeman leads the free safety group, one of the weakest groups on the defense. Odlindo Mare is one of the best kickers in the league at this point in his career. Six-year contract, uh, we, don't, we don't need to worry about him. Lastly, Matt Turk, who is the punter and his rating seems low to me. I remember him being really good. The Miami quarterbacks aren't very much a threat to anyone. With Angulae on the final year of his contract and considered trading him to Cincinnati for John Kitna, we could use a good quarterback like him, but I really didn't want to give Angulae away. So I considered trading Patrick Sertan. He's going to be expensive this offseason and I'd rather get something out of him than nothing. The reason I felt the Bengals would give up Kitna is because they have Palmer sitting in the back ready to start soon after sitting his rookie season. Kitna himself isn't a bad quarterback. He can very much carry his own weight. The previous season was one of his best performances, and this is a what have you done recently league. He's done pretty good. The Bengals threw in a third round pick, and to be honest, this was a really good deal for the Bengals, but only if they're able to resign him at the end of the year. Our quarterback will be Kitna at the start of the season. I do feel much more comfortable with this group now. There is an odd man out in Rosenfels. 
I called the Bengals back and since they were happy with Sertan, they decided oh, I'll give you a fourth. So uh, you know, now we have a fourth. Now you can imagine we have a hole at cornerback, which we do, but Reggie Howard will be able to hold down that position for at least a year. We do need to find depth. That's where this guy comes into play, Asante Samuel. He's a free agent and maybe someday he'll be a pro bowler, who knows? He'll be under a three year deal and hopefully he can develop to be decent. Like I already stated earlier, Kitna is going to be the starter, no question about it. Orlando Brown will also be starting at right tackle. Reggie Howard will be taking over the left cornerback spot for the traded Patrick Zertan. Madison will be covering the right side of the field in case you're wondering how the depth chart works in this game. Before we start the season, Dave Wanstead is the coach of this team. Don't let his bio fool you, he got lucky to be the coach of this team and he did nothing to improve. When he was handed this job, all he did was kill every running back he ever had. I'm going to simulate the first five games. Reason for that is because the trade deadline is at week six. If the team has a losing record in the first five games, I'm gonna look into trading players away. We're sitting at two and three. Based on the scores, excluding the Jets game, the team didn't score more than one touchdown in any of them. This team needs a lot more help on the offensive side of the ball. Kitna did not have the best start to the season, throwing six interceptions and only two touchdowns. I'm going to blame that on him trying to learn a new team's playbook. Ricky Williams leads the team in rushing yards, but his average at 3.9 is pretty low. You can see the Dave Wanstead effect on him. This is the most shocking thing this season. Chris Chambers is playing lights out, but that's because David Boston has been relatively quiet. Chambers is on a contract year, which means this is really good for him. Junior Seau is leading the team in sacks so far at five. That's interesting considering Jason Taylor sits at four and a half and Ngulae at three and a half. Madison has two interceptions. Freeman tied with them at two. Zach Thomas, one. Olindo Made, very disappointing. He missed four field goals. We could be sitting at three and two instead of two and three. Lastly, Matt Turk, really good. That average is superb. Now, before I look into trading anyone, I wanted to show back in 2K5, CPU teams would trade with another CPU team. Pittsburgh made a blockbuster trade with Washington, Sean Springs for Aaron Smith, Bills traded Pat Williams to the Bengals for Rudy Johnson, Arizona got Daryl Gardner for Burt Berry. Bengals were really active. I went looking for one loss teams that may be looking for a player that will help their Super Bowl chances. The Bears were the team I chose to look at. Their offense isn't that explosive, but if they got to 3-1 and one off of their defense, maybe they can use a boost on that defensive line. I wanted to boost our offense with Marty Booker and the Bears could certainly use him googly. I accepted the trade and what's funny about this is that this is a real trade that actually happened. Hopefully with this trade Kidna gets some much needed help since Boston disappeared earlier this season. We do have a gap at defensive end now. Jay Williams is the next man up. I don't want to take that chance. So I signed Chad Bratsky as a gap player. I decided to replace Boston at left wide out for Booker. Weirdly enough, his name was Red, which indicates injury, but he wasn't on the injuries list. So David Boston has severely underperformed this season, but maybe Booker's presence will help everyone out on offense. At right wide out, Chambers will be starting. At left end, Jay Williams will continue to play back up to the Bratsky. That's it for all the midseason moves. Hopefully that's enough to either bring this team up a notch or do so poorly. We get a great pick. So after starting the year two and three, they would go seven and four the rest of the season. Four of the seven losses came to New England and Buffalo. You need to beat the division before you can beat anyone else. Injuries could have played a huge part in the final stretch. Sam Madison fractured his leg. He missed the final four games of the year. After having those two interceptions in the beginning of the year, he was pretty quiet. Miami would end up missing the playoffs by one game. Look at the Kansas City Chiefs sitting there with their 8-8 eight eight record. Chicago somehow didn't even make the playoffs after their 3-1 start. 
Houston had the best record at 13 and 3. Cincinnati won their division. Chicago finished 3 and 9 after the trade with Miami. After John Kitna's rough two touchdown, six interception start, he finished with 20 touchdowns, 13 interceptions. He bounced back really well. I'm sure Marty Booker had something to do with it. Ricky Williams continues his 3.9 average, being ran into the ground by this team. Hopefully he doesn't break down soon, we're going to need him in this rebuild. No one cracked a thousand yards, but considering Chambers had 400 yards and Booker had 150 in the first five games, in the 11 games after he caught up to Chambers, he helped this offense. Chambers had a slight down season, but he still put up great numbers. Marty Booker may have revitalized his career here in Miami, and Mr. Swole, David Boston, had an interesting year. Started out slow, but when Booker came on the team, he picked up his production. Zach Thomas leads the team with tackles, along with the rest of the linebacking core. Jason Taylor had 10.5 sacks to lead the team. Junior Seau behind him at 8.5. Couldn't keep up the sack of game production. Could have been in Gulai causing drop off in sacks. Jason Taylor gets his third straight 10 sack season. Seau had what could be his best season in the past five years, maybe more. Uh, remember when I said I hope Derek Pope doesn't start? He somehow managed to get on the field and all he did was get six sacks. No biggie. Chad Bratsky had a pretty decent season considering he was just there to fill the gap. I wouldn't be surprised if we get some calls and free agency. Zach Thomas had himself a pretty decent year. Low tackles compared to what he's used to, but that might change next season. Reggie Howard, the corner opposite of Madison, performed like his history. Two interceptions. This team had a hard time causing turnovers. The reason Madison isn't on here is that he's on the injured reserve. After missing four kicks in eight tries, he only missed one in the next 15. Old Linda Mare picked it up, that is for sure. Matt Turk continues his very, very good season. Adewale Angulae had a better season than Jason Taylor. Do I regret this trade? Not one bit. He was going to ask for some big money after the season, so hopefully Chicago can give it to him. Carson Palmer had a really good season with the Bengals. He performed, he outperformed John Kitna. Do I regret this trade? Uh, I'm not sure yet. We needed a good quarterback and Kitna does that. Patrick Sertan was going to eat a lot of our money. He had five interceptions in nine games. He ended up getting injured with a broken kneecap. Who knows if he'll be the same next season. Other players that are on the team that I didn't highlight, Jay Williams, he did pretty well as a reliever. Moreland Greenwood had himself a very good season. Orlando Mari had a strong finish to the year. And Matt Turk had himself his best season ever, I believe. So now the wild card round is here. Only one 9-7 team besides the 8-8 eight eight Chiefs. Everyone else had double digits, so a tough year overall in the NFL. The Chiefs pull a miracle over the Bills. Titans beat the Bengals, which makes that draft pick slightly better. Carolina gets demolished by Seattle. Lastly, Green Bay shocked the Eagles with a blowout. Every team who had a bye week finished at 11-5 except for Houston. The disparity in the playoffs doesn't seem to be very big. Having a week off helped no one. The Titans took down the division rival. The Chiefs have become the AFC East killer. Green Bay sneaks away with another win over Atlanta. Seattle continues their playoff run over Minnesota. I don't think anyone saw the Chiefs in the championship round at 8-8, eight and eight. and Green Bay at the number 6 seed in the playoffs will have a classic showdown against Seattle. In a shootout, Kansas City beat the Titans in possibly an overtime game, and Green Bay pulled away with a shootout of their own at Seattle. 12th man didn't help today. Who would have thunk the 8-8 eight eight Chiefs would play the 9-7 Packers in a Super Bowl 1 rematch? The Chiefs would win 17-13, but boy was this a postseason for the ages. Now stick around, the Pro Bowl is going to be next. There will be no offseason in this video. That will be for the next one, if this one does well. It's a rainy day in Honolulu, but that's not stopping the fans from coming to see the best the NFL has to offer this season. Trent Green is here after winning the Super Bowl last week. Next to him, Air McNair, who will be starting the game. 
On the field, Derek Mason is warming up with McAllister. He led the entire NFL this season in receiving. The AFC will get the ball first to start the game. It's a deep kick into the end zone. James is back there. The Colts running back takes it out, heads straight forward, goes to the outside, breaks the tackle, and down at the 26. First play of the game, AFC team will pass the ball. McNair to Johnson in tight coverage, but he holds on to it. In second and one, McNair pitches it to LT, who teaches a defender how to lay down. He outruns everyone, but somehow one of the defenders catches up to him to save the touchdown. After the big run, they feed it to LT again, who is tackled at the four yard line. In second and goal, McNair throws a fade in the end zone for a touchdown. The AFC are up 7 0. NFC out there, hand off to Bennett, who is stuffed at the line. Second down, Culpepper drops back, the roast to Owens in tight coverage. Big play for the NFC. They go back to the ground, but stuffed once again, so Culpepper decides to throw in the next play, but Owens' momentum carries him out of bound. Third down to extend the drive, Culpepper throws to Moss to keep it going. The AFC is getting tired of Culpepper, and they send Bailey to deliver a message. It must have shook Culpepper a bit as the next throw was off target. AFC brings the blitz again and Culpepper just chucks it. Lucky it wasn't picked off. The NFC would punt the ball on fourth down, getting it inside the 15 yard line. After their touchdown drive, the AFC have the momentum. They don't really do much with it on the first two plays. Then just like that, they lost it all. They would do a short punt that gets a bounce, and believe it or not, that's Culpepper returning that kick. Throughout most of their career, Culpepper was always on point with Moss, and they do it again. How does one stop the Jedi Culpepper? Bring a blitz. Next play, Culpepper throws quick to Smith, but it bounces off his pads. Looking to get something, Culpepper passes to Bennett underneath, but tackled way short of the first. The NFC punted again, but this time it doesn't get past the 15 yard line. Rain making it hard to attempt field goals. After that opening drive, the AFC seemed to have slowed down. How that pass wasn't picked off is beyond me. The NFC has been doing a good job shutting down LT since that big run earlier. McNair has time in the pocket, but doesn't seem to trust the line, throws to his fullback and it bounces off his shoulder pads. I'm not sure the fans thought the NFL's best would be this exciting. Another short punt that gets a good skip and Culpepper shows his frustration on that man. If you are a fan of the Vikings, I'm sure you're having a fun day watching Culpepper the Moss so far today. Culpepper again to Moss on the short pass. They're so good together, I imagine them being Vikings for life. Bennett, I'm short of the first. Third down, Culpepper fires one out to Owens who holds on to the ball. They then give the ball to Bennett, who dances around and gets in to tie the game. The AFC have to get some kind of momentum going. Anderson gains a few yards. LT hasn't done much at all since that big run and still hasn't done much. McNair is going to have to carry this team. Throws to Johnson over the middle, who drops the pass. Doesn't matter what this team does right now, they can't get anything going. Call Pepper. Still returning kicks. The NFC has been two players so far, Culpepper and Moss. This time, the AFC has caught on to that, knocking it away. Culpepper says, you think you know me? And zips one the TO who has just one guy to beat but can't and gets tackled out of bound. Culpepper pretends to be a statue, throws to Smith who breaks the tackle down inside the red zone. The NFC is making a push, but AFC comes with a blitz. Culpepper chucks it. Lucky it wasn't picked off. The AFC bringing the pressure again, Culpepper throws it to Shockey but knocked down by Lewis. Third down now, Culpepper checks it down to Bennett who can't get the first. The NFC team settles for the field goal up 10 to 7 now. The same story for the AFC before, can't get anything going, McNair sacked. Next play, McNair says screw it and throws it deep to Mason who can't grab it, gets hit hard. Third down now, McNair has no time, throws off balance and incomplete. There's no refunds for the Pro Bowl, right? Uh, asking for a friend. Welcome back to the Culpepper Show. What can he do? Probably make his own babies, but I, I can't confirm that. The NFC at midfield, quick throw to the left, no gain, Smith calls for a timeout. Next play, Culpepper throws into really tight coverage and it's almost a fantastic play. The rain is really affecting this game. Third down, Culpepper throws it again, but this time the defender plays hot potato with the ball. 
Maybe next time they should consider putting the Pro Bowl inside of a dome, because today the rain has been changing the playing field. Hopefully nobody gets hurt. The AFC has half a minute, but it won't matter if they keep playing like this. McNair is getting tired and frustrated with this offense. He decides to take matters into his own hands and takes off with it for a huge gain. That might have been the spark this team needs. Jolly holds on to the catch to get across midfield. They would spike the ball to save a timeout. They took too long to spike the ball and needed a quick play, but knocked down. McNair tries to get rid of the ball quickly again, incomplete. With two seconds left, you would think they would do a Hail Mary. Nope. Fake punt, because it's the Pro Bowl. Let them have fun, even if it's depressing to watch. That would end the half, and I hope you guys are still watching because there's still another half. Hopefully the second half is a bit more exciting. The kick is rather short. The NFC will start this half with the ball. Culpepper rolls to his left. The pressure forces a bad pass that hits the ground. This time Culpepper goes back to Moss and it hasn't failed yet. Inches from a first down, Bennett makes Lewis miss and gets the first down. Next play, short throw to Owens in traffic for a small gain. They go back to Bennett and he goes nowhere but the line of scrimmage. Culpepper has a really quick release, but this throw is way off target. What was the over under on there being a punt two minutes into the second half? Mason decides to run it, breaks the tackle, he has room but his teammate tackles him. Let's see if the AFC can move the ball down the field, at least they're still trying. Next play, pressure comes off the edge, McNair to Johnson and he actually holds on to it. The offensive line has been getting dominated, but McNair moves to his right, throws to his fullback, and this time, he holds on. They go back to LT, who finds room to get close to the first. LT takes the sweep to his left, has space, jukes out Dawkins for the first down. LT is gaining momentum, but the NFC shuts that down quick. This is the closest the AFC has been to their end zone since the beginning, but they're stalling out. Next play, McNair takes a hard hit. I believe it was supposed to be a shovel pass. This has been better than the whole first half, but we didn't come here to see kicks. The NFC tries to get something going on the ground. Michael Bennett is doing his best to get a first down, but comes up short. He'll get a third chance and does just that, drags the defender past the first down. The NFC at this point looks like they're just trying to run clock. Or are they? Culpepper chucks it to Owens, who can't hold on to it. Third down to keep the drive going, and I don't know what happened there. We enter the fourth quarter with a punt. With the way things are going, I'm sure the NFC are thinking about those bonus check. Mason returning the kick. Last time he almost broke one, this time he doesn't get much. The AFC is running out of time. McNair is trying to get this team moving, but everyone seems to be standing still. His favorite target today has been the fullback. He chucks one deep to him, but it's dropped. I think this is the play McNair says, screw it. He rolls to his left and just tries to keep this drive going. They try to get LT back into the game plan, but nothing goes. This right here is as open as you can ask a receiver to be, and he dropped it. To keep the drive going, McNair finds his moss, but gets tackled short of the first. McNair takes the game into his own hands again and gets the first down. Now the momentum is back, and McNair gets sacked. Following play, McNair says it ain't gonna be that easy and throws a perfect pass to Johnson short of the end zone. They hand it to LT on the next play and he heads in for the touchdown. They're back up top, 14 to 10. Now the NFC have to get something going, but it doesn't look like that's gonna happen. Next play, Culpepper throws a beautiful pass to Owens, but it gets knocked out. Culpepper is doing his best to get something going, but another drop pass would end this drive. Question, do you think this will be the last punt of the game? I'm surprised they even decided to punt it considering how much time is left. Mason has a decent return. The AFC isn't going to sit on the ball. First play, a throw to Mason. Next play, they hand it off to LT who has blockers, but not many yards. Again, they toss it to LT, finds the edge, jukes out Dawkins again for the first down. Third time's a charm, LT carries it again, jukes out <laughs> Dawkins again, and he has a lot of open space in front of him, tackled inside the red zone. Now they're going to run the clock, Anderson carries this time, they hand it off to LT, who's actually tackled by Dawkins this time. 
LT gets the call one last time, but can't get the first down. To make it a touchdown lead, the AFC kick a field goal, up now 17 to 10. The NFC will have to work fast, Culpepper throws in coverage, but complete. Next play, Culpepper throws to Moss, who makes two guys miss and has the space, but can't outrun the last guy. Though momentum is getting hot, Culpepper rolls to his right, and he's lucky it wasn't picked off. Next play, they decide to hand it off to Bennett for a short gain. Third down now, Culpepper throws quickly, but it's tipped away. Game is on the line, Culpepper throws to Ty Streets, but he dropped it! The game is effectively over. The AFC will come away with a win after the kneel down. The AFC will get that paycheck. I hope you all enjoyed the video. If there's enough love and support for it, I'll make a part two, but considering this took about 30 hours to put together, let's just say it'll take some time.